Um, let me first thank you all for having me here. Um, it's really nice to be in a room full of Gnostics and you know the occasional Hermeticist and whatnot. I know that uh, you're quite a collection here, um, to say the least. And uh, my talk should hopefully intersect with a number of people's <coughs> interests in, in all of these matters. Um, it's titled, The Four Elements, The Four Humors, Wonder Woman and Timothy Leary. Now, by the end of this talk, you will see how all of those are tied together, okay? Which has been one of my joys to um, uh, sort of discover and uncover as I've been looking into some of these topics. Um, how I come to be looking at these odd things, I'm an initiate of the Hermetic Order of Chicago, now the Hermetic Fellowship, uh, which has both Golden Dawn and Modern Wiccan um, lineages. My teacher considers herself a Hermeticist, although now she's doing uh, Chinese Nei Dan exercises because she's also an acupuncturist. I'm also an astrologer. Um, if you want, uh, you can tune into my YouTube channel. It's called Astro Aspects, and I give you a sample chart for each day telling you what's going on astrologically for the day. Uh, I've got over 700 videos up. I used to do it every day. Now I do it for f every four days. Uh, I'm also a psychotherapist, uh, clinical social worker with masters in social work from the University <coughs> of Michigan, go blue. And um, trained in Ericksonian hypnosis and uh, neurolinguistic programming, and I throw in internal family systems and a whole bunch of other fun stuff like that. So, uh, so I've been digging around these things as well as, as a friend of mine says, I collect religions. And so I've been digging into religions since, uh, well, I was reading The Way of Zen in seventh grade. But in this crowd, I'm sure that's not unusual. So I, I know that this is a crowd of a lot of seekers and intellectuals. And who else has 5,000 books in their library? <laughs> yeah, OK. Yeah. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. You people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I we'll we'll get you there. Book form. <laughs> <laughs> With some of the bookstores in Chicago, okay. we'll get you there. Um, so let's start off by talking in general about who are some of the people that I'm going to be talking about just briefly, and then I'll go into it longer, because I have their pictures there. There's Hippocrates, considered the father of uh, modern medicine, although some people would debate that historically. There's William Marston, who um, is one of the more fascinating people that you will find, I think. And I will be introducing you to him, since probably no one knows who he is here. There's Wonder Woman, who I'm sure most of you are familiar with, but don't know the context. And does anyone here not know who Timothy Leary is? I met him once on an acid trip. <laughs> One person. <laughs> Timothy Leary was very famous in the 1960s. He was the professor who was kicked out of Harvard for experimenting with first mushrooms, which he did uh, legitimately and then LSD, and uh, at one point, God bless him, Richard Nixon called him the most dangerous man in America. So I'll go into a little bit of Dr. Leary's adventures and whatnot too. So first of all, let me, um, let's see, I don't have uh, a board, but that's why I have everything in the handout. Is there? Yep. Yeah. It's behind the screen. Ah. Oftentimes, it's, it's handy for me to, to do a few little diagrams, even if you have them there. I'm not as bad as those show. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Whoa. A farm of Portland. Yes. Hey. We're doing so well. That's how gravity works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you that needed a refresher. Okay. So. The man behind the curtain. Pay no attention. I'd like to start off with something about as basic as you can get for where the ancients saw things. Now, a lot of people think of 
you know, the elements, and if they're modern in chemists, they think of the hundred, extra hundred or whatever, gold, silver, iron, and whatnot. But in ancient times, there were the four elements, air, earth, fire, and water. But there were principles that were even more basic than that. And this is actually going to be the start of this whole system that I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to relate it to Timothy Leary and Wonder Woman and actually modern business consulting, if you can believe that. All right. First of all, we have up here at the top, hot. Down here at the bottom, cold. Over here, wet. And over here, dry. Now, it's sort of arbitrary. You could put hot at the bottom and cold at the top, I suppose, but um, heat tends to rise, so we put it up there. So when you think of hot, what comes to mind? Heat, rising, what else? Fire. Air. Air to a certain extent, yeah. Air can be hot, what else? Fire. Fire, okay, the ultimate in hotness, okay. We also have a principle of activity, right? So we've got all of those things connected. Wet, wet is dissolving. Anybody remember Solvay et Coagula? Okay. Wet is interconnecting. It is taking down barriers somewhat and finding interconnections. Right. Cold, we have passivity with cold, restriction, restriction. exactly, what else? Do you think Death. Death, Death. Mm -hmm. solidification, solidifying, right, and dry, thoughts on dry? Passionless, hmm? passionless, passionless, or um, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's also the sense of if you look at, say, a clod of earth, if it's wet, it's mud, and you can't hold it together well, but if it's dry, it crumbles and falls apart, okay? So if we start looking at these things, we start to find these principles, these kinds of feeling things. So what happens when we start to combine them? Well, with hot and wet, we get air, uh, which the classical symbol for is like this. Now, with these two combined, we have activity and connection coming together, right? Makes sense. All right. We also have wet and cold. Any water. guesses as to which one? Water. Water. Water, yeah. And uh, we have the downward pointed triangle for that one. Over here, dry and cold. Earth. Earth. Earth, yeah. Pretty simple, pretty basic. And up here, we of course have fire. Now, this combination. Oh, there was some debate about the specifics of these things um, <coughs> among, between the Stoics and the Aristotelians and whatnot. But for the most part, the ancient world saw these as the basic principles. You know, if you have, and everybody and everything was made up of different combinations of these, right? Okay. So this goes back to Greek times, pretty simple. And you can see on your diagram, that's with the handout, we've got the combination. It's, it's put here a little bit differently. But, you know, it's like, okay, fine. You know, once you got it, though, what do you do with it? All right? Well, how many folks here um, have at least dabbled in astrology to a certain extent? Oh, good, good, good. Okay. So I can kind of ramp this up a little bit. You'll note that the zodiac is said to be made up of the quadruplicities and polarities, right? 
triplicities. And the triplicities, okay? The four parts, the elements, and then cardinal, fixed, and mutable as the principles, okay? Guess how far back that goes? Anybody know when the earliest? That one, that one. The no, our earliest note of when the elements were connected in, which was a shock to me, I just learned this last week from Christopher Brennan in an online webinar. Um, it was in the first century CE, the first written record of the elements being connected in with the zodiac. The particular writer, 175 CE, Vettius Valens. We have no record of Babylon, no record of the early Greek astrologers. Ptolemy didn't even mention this. And Ptolemy was a um, contemporary of Valens. Matter of fact, Ptolemy didn't mention a lot of things. He didn't mention the planets in the signs. And there were a lot of different things. As a matter of fact, if you were to talk to, there's been a, a recent trend in astrology. I don't know if anyone's been following all the Greek and Latin manuscripts that have been translated recently. It's been an absolute wonder to see about the traditional astrology, the Hellenistic astrology, where all these things are coming from. And we're discovering a lot of stuff from that. But briefly, the zodiac started off, yes, in Babylon. But was it, and in Egypt, but it was originally a system for seeing, oh, when are the omens, <laughs> okay? And it was a system of asterisms. You know that word? Okay, like asterisk, all right? Uh, for instance, the most famous asterism that most people know is the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper isn't a constellation, folks. It's part of a constellation, the Great Bear, but a collection, a pattern of stars. And what they did was they saw patterns of stars and they kept track of where the planets were with those. And they were able to tell, okay, after so long we know that uh, Mars is gonna back up and blah, 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 and that's, that's how they could predict where the planets were gonna be. Now, they got really good at that, at that system of omens in Babylon, all right? It was later that they put them into collections of, oh, let's do three of them because most of them were about 10 degrees and let's put three of them together, and they came up with the Zodiac. By the way, just as a really interesting little aside, they spent hundreds of years looking at all the different <coughs> things that happened in the kingdom, and there are great collections of when the omens are. I was listening to one of my astrological teachers, Lee Lehman, uh, she had a video, and one of the things she mentioned was that there was um, in this collection a listing of what to do if a child is born with two heads <laughs> and what it meant. But they got so exact as to where, where the position of the two heads were in relation to each other. And she was looking at this and there was a, and at the time she was looking, um, this was years and years ago, uh, in Egypt, it was reported that there was a child born with two heads in such and such positions, and at the same time, I believe that's when Egypt gave up um, its uh, Sinai, or, or gained the Sinai back. It was one of these land trades with Israel, and um, the omen was exactly what fit, which I thought really was interesting. So these guys were looking at the correlations of things, you know, what are the gods doing? But it wasn't until they started a conceptual framework. And as near as we can tell, Van Lins was the first to write it down, but later on, but it was probably from some earlier sources. And we've lost some of those manuscripts and such. Okay? But we have that whole system and it shows up in the zodiac. Now it's right here. Okay, and in the second part of your um, handout. We have the usual thing here. Aries is fire and cardinal. Taurus is earth and fixed. Gemini is mutable and air. Um, then we get to water and cancer and cardinal. And these things repeat. And, and if you're going to learn some basic astrology, you know, it's good to know those and see how they combine and put, put together. Okay? By the way, you're not your sun sign. 
people know that? Mm -hmm. Okay, you're your rising sign. Mm -hmm. You know, sun sign astrology was invented in the 20th century to sell newspapers. Okay, so if you want to get better results from your daily horoscope, number one, don't do daily, do weekly or monthly. Okay, and look at your rising sign, not your sun sign. You'll what's, get much better results. What's the difference? What's the difference? Yes. Um, the sun sign sold newspapers because it was really easy to tell what your sun sign is based on your birthday because the sun is so regular in its orbit. So on March 17th, my birthday, yes, I thought I was Irish until I was about five, um, the sun is at about 26 degrees of cancer, more or less. You know, there's a little variation. So it'll always be that so people will know, oh, I'm a Pisces. But at 4.44 a.m. in Hancock, Michigan, it was 26 Capricorn rising. So it's much more individualized if you look at your rising sign. And according to the ancients, that's where the soul incarnated. You went through the planes from the realm of the stars, and as you went through each of the spheres, you were more or less imprinted with what was going on with that sphere, finally coming out into in the east and incarnating through the ascendant. Okay. Your, your ascendant is the sign that's on the eastern horizon. Right? On the eastern horizon. Okay. Ascendant, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Hmm? Ascendant, right? Ascendant, yeah. Um, the opposite of that is called the descendant, which is the gates of death. And then the other points in the horoscope that are considered important are the midheaven, what was assigned directly south, and then the IC, which I always mispronounce, you probably know Latin better than I, some of you, Imam Coeli? Imam Celli. Celli? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Latin's weird. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, that's why, one of the few reasons why I tried to learn Finnish when I was in college. Um, the only thing Finnish has going for it is it's totally phonetic, but otherwise there's 15 cases and 200 ways to inflect verbs. There's even two different words for what. <laughs> Ask me about it sometime. <laughs> in any case, but it is phonetic. So we have this, this archetype of the zodiac, which wound up being really handy for a lot of different things. And really, personality astrology wasn't really done up until the 20th century. You know, when people looked at your chart, they saw that, oh, the third house was your brothers and sisters, not your ability to communicate as in modern astrology, okay? Seventh house was not you, your business partner or your life partner, wife, husband, whatever. Um, so what wound up happening, which actually works, I, I know, <laughs> I've done it, is in the 20th century they said, oh, let's take this as a template for the whole person and their experience. But you were seen as that rising sign, as that ascendant, all right? And what you were seen as was your planet, okay? So I am Saturnian because Saturn rules Capricorn. So you, that's where our terms, jovial, Saturnian, mercurial, come from. You know, if, if that would have, if sun sign astrology would have been more common, we would have been, you would have seen references in Chaucer and such to, you know, the Piscean, this and that. But no, they were more talking about the planets and everything. By the way, anybody interested in Chaucer and his interest in astrology, there is a um, dissertation online called um, Chaucer's Solar Pageant, where the fellow shows how Chaucer was going through, it's either the planets or the zodiac, no, it would have been the planets through um, the zodiac, and he goes through the zodiac signs in the Canterbury Tales, giving examples of each one. But also, Chaucer was the first person to write a treatise in English on a um, scientific instrument. He wrote how to use the astrolabe. <laughs> and that's the first record we have of anything written with those kinds first of instructions. First how-to book. Yeah. <laughs> first how-to book, yes, yes. We'll get later to the first book in, uh, in uh, in occupational medicine. So, in any case, if you're going to study the Western mysteries and this whole esoteric tradition, it's good to see that there are so many astrologers in the room because you see so many references 
to the whole idea of the religion of the stars and as above, so below, and all the rest. Um, so that became imbued with the four elements, as I said, probably first century BCE, but Valens talked about it in 175 with his writings. So we have this kind of grafted on to the zodiac. So how does this then fit into um, the humors and personality and that sort of thing? Um, oh, well, let me mention one other thing, which, which brings me to the, the diagrams below. Uh, you folks are probably familiar with, you know, the Sun rules Leo and Jupiter rules Pisces. And by the way, Neptune does not rule Pisces. Outer planets, please, 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 Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto do not rule signs, okay? <clears throat> if I'm gonna be dogmatic about anything, I will be dogmatic about that. But um, those things were interconnected. The rulerships are called domicile rulerships. There's another thing called the exaltations, all right? Like Mars is exalted in Capricorn, okay? These things are called essential dignities, all right? But modern astrology only uses those first two, the domicile rulership and the exaltation rulership. There were <coughs> actually three others, and I wanna just do a brief aside for you astrologers here because there's something really cool with how the um, elements intersect with the signs and how you can do something really neat with that. There's something called triplicity rulership. Now this is on the bottom of your chart, of the first handout. Triplicity rulers go by these elements. So if you look at the triplicity rulers table that I have here, you'll see Aries, Leo, and Sagittarius. We have three planets connected to them. Now you'll also notice day, night, and cooperating. What's with that? Well, one of the marvelous things that came out of our research into the Greek and Latin manuscripts is we forgot about an entire thing that was essential to horoscope interpretation. And that was whether it was a day chart or a night chart. Okay, who'd have thunk? But whether the sun was above or below the horizon was considered critical, and it was so critical that it wasn't even written about much. It was kind of the soup that everybody swam in in ancient times, so we had to infer about it. So for instance, Mars was a lot more malefic in a chart if it was a day chart. If it was a night chart, Mars was cooled down. And guess what? If you were born during the day, Saturn actually winds up being much nicer to you because Saturn's coldness wound up being warmed up by the day, day chart. And of course, if Saturn wound up on the same side as the sun, that was even better. And there's a whole book, um, yeah, th this doctrine is called sect, planetary sect. Um, if you want to get a nice little book or some write-ups on it, see the works of Rob Hand. Uh, Hand especially worked with some of this. He has some articles in the Mountain Astrologer. And if you go to Hand's um, website, um, he actually has a book on it. He's revised his thinking, but the basics are still there. So day or night chart. So take a look at this. The day ruler, day triplicity ruler, is the sun, night is Jupiter, and the cooperating mixed ruler is Saturn, okay? So we can go through the rest of these and go through the elemental rulerships, okay? They, they list the signs, but really this is fire, earth, air, and water. And they each have three different planets. So what do you do with that? Well, number one, if you have say the moon in a night chart and the moon is in O Virgo, you actually have a moon that can manage to do things confidently because the ancients saw the planets as either able to perform the task, performing the task but then falling apart and destroying later, or preventing the task and the task was whether it could do what it needed to for the, for the uh, house that it ruled, okay? So think of older astrology as being more house-based because they were interested in those departments of your life. And could the planets that were running that section of your life manage things? So for instance, 
I may have somebody, if I'm doing an astrological consultation, and their seventh house ruler, you know, the domicile ruler is totally screwed, okay? And the exaltation ruler is bad. Well, a modern astrologer would say, oh, well, you may not ever get married. But their triplicity ruler might be in the ninth house. And it might be in good shape. And I'd say, well, you'd have to work at it a little bit, but um, uh, go and travel to a foreign country or uh, hang out with foreigners and you may well find somebody uh, as a long-term partner. Or go to, a, go to church, ninth house, same difference. Although traveling would probably be more fun. Um, in any I case, been to our church, have you? Uh, <laughs> I've only been to one mass. Yeah. I got to say that traveling is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that gives you, in fact, instead of being so fatalistic as people said medieval astrology was, you actually have more wiggle room to help the person. Now there were two other, um, what are called essential dignities. There was the term ruler and the face ruler. I won't get into those today. But I want to tell you a really neat little trick you can do with this. If you're looking at a chart and you have, uh, let's say, the second house, and it's a night chart, and say you have a Libra in the second house. Okay, the Libra is ruling the second house. So it's a night chart and Libra's ruling your second house. You can actually tell what the person's fortunes are in terms of their money and finances for the, each of the thirds of their life. And the way that you do that is, you go, oh, it's a night chart. So I start with Mercury, then that's gonna be the first part of their life. The second part of their life is gonna be the other light ruler, day. So you look at Saturn, and then the last part of their life in terms of their money, second house, is gonna be Jupiter. So you look at the conditions of those planets and you can see whether their fortunes will go up or down or whatever. All right. How is the thirds of the life determined? Then, then you use the medieval rules for figuring out how long a person is going to live. <laughs> or you go 25 years as your rough estimate for each third. Okay. But yeah, there were some, some rules. And quite frankly, the medieval rules for length of life don't work anymore because of modern medicine. Okay. Um, whereas before they were really good, I mean, when I first got into medieval astrology, I asked Robert Zoller, I said, why do I want to learn this stuff? And he said, because they were really good at prediction. And I said, why was that? Because otherwise their heads got chopped off. <laughs> because you went to your local king or, you know, lord or bishop or whatever and offered your services and they would give you a chart. And you, and, and they would tell me about this person. You'd go away, you'd come back a few days later and say, my lord, I'm sorry to tell you this person died in before they were able to suckle. Or they died shortly after they, you know, in their first year. There were rules called the five differentia of birth to see how long somebody would live. Because a king wanted to know if their kid was going to inherit. And they were really precise at that. But those rules don't work with antibiotics and neonatal surgery and all the rest now. Um, although you can tell, okay, you were...